everybody welcome to searchlight church online let's worship god together i was buried beneath my shame what could carry that kind of weight it was my Oh, my name, and I'm in, 
words, we will worship you. This morning, God, with everything going around on in our world today, God, we just press in to worship you today, God. Would you just have your way, have your way in this service this morning. Lord, whoever, whoever's out there listening, whatever we're going through, whatever pressures or strains we're feeling, God, we just trust in you this morning, God. We put our hope and our faith in you, Jesus. Thank you for pursuing us, God, like no one else ever could. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind to me Deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Yeah. your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. That's your story. Sing it out. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it. I don't 
Tear down, coming after me. Sing that again. No, no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. To me, one more time. Yeah. There's no shadow you won't light up. Now you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. The lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. good to worship the Lord. It's good to feel His presence this morning, isn't it? Worshiping God is just so important. It's such a big piece of a Christian's life because it's our opportunity to bless Him. We're the ones looking for the blessing, and God's so willing to do so, but we need also to bless Him. And you know, the Bible says that our testimony and the blood of the Lamb is how we overcome. So whatever you're going through this morning, know that your testimony of who you are in God and what God's done for you and the precious blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin, that's your testimony. Not only to share with those around that don't know him or to share with Christians that need encouragement, but to share it and remember it yourself and to share it and bless God with it, thanking him for all that he's done. He's done so much. So let's never forget about the blood of the Lamb and our personal testimony of how God reached down and picked us up out of nothing and made something out of us. I know I have that testimony for myself. So as we go to prayer, let's make it a prayer of praise as well as asking God to touch us and to touch our loved ones and those in need this morning. Let's go to prayer. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. It is not like you. Lord God, you're amazing how you love us and you just keep on loving us through the good and the bad and the ugly. Father, you're always there for us day and night. So Father, Lord, we just thank you, God, and we just ask you to move among us, God. Wherever we are, if we're listening by ourselves or watching by ourselves, Lord, or we're with a group, God, just move by your Spirit upon us. Father, we want to feel and sense your presence, God. Lord, pull us into your place, God that we might, God, be sharing our presence and your presence together, God, that we might grow and continue to be ministered to you and by you. So, Father, God, we give you all the thanks and all the praise 
in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's continue to worship him, for he is worthy.
even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Come on, right in your homes right now, just declare these words. Come on, if you believe it, sing it out, even if. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. that the church is not bound by a building. We're not bound by whether or not we can be together in person. We are the church, Jesus, because you died for us, because you gave your life for us and you saved us out of everything that we were stuck in. God, you are a miracle worker today. So whatever you're going through this morning, would you just cry out to him right now? That is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. And so Father, we thank you for your presence and for your goodness and for your mercy that's new every morning. And so, God, thank you for preparing our hearts for the message today. Lord, come into every single home, every place where this is being watched. Lord, and do what only you can do. You know every single need that's represented this morning. And God, would you just meet us right where we are today. And we thank you for another day to breathe and live and worship your name. And so be with us the rest of the service, we pray in Jesus' name. Right there in your home, everybody said, amen, amen. Thanks so much for joining us for Church Online today. My name is Tim, and I'm so glad you decided to spend some time with us this Sunday morning. While you're here, if you could just do a couple things for us, that would be great. If you could take a moment and go ahead and fill out your digital connection card, it would really help us stay connected. It's right there in the description of this video, and a link will pop up in the chat. And on that connection card, you can put your name, anything we can pray with you for, or if you'd like to sign up to serve, or what we're really excited about is that life groups are starting to come together. So if you're interested in being in a life group or hosting a life group, 
Fill it out on your connection card right now while I'm talking, and now I'll submit it to, it, uh, to us, and we'll let you know what groups are around and what groups you can get into. So make sure you fill out that connection card. That would be awesome. If you're with us for the first time, we are so glad that you're here. Thank you for hanging out with us. And if you follow that same link to the connection card, you can let us know it's your first time. And we'd love to just send you a card home to say thank you for spending time with us. And if we can do anything for you as a church, that would be our pleasure. So make sure you fill those out and submit them before the end of the service so we can stay connected and nobody falls through the cracks. Just a couple of quick announcements that we want to keep you abreast of, and that's the idea that uh, we'll be meeting outside. In fact, if you're local and you'd like to get here for the 1030 service, we'll be outside right behind Seashore School. 410 Broadway and Long Branch. As long as the weather permits, we'll keep doing outdoor services uh, where we'll have live worship and live preaching of the word. And it's just great to see people people face to face. Uh, along those lines, we are talking uh, with the owners of C Seashore School about what the options are as it kind of gets colder about how we can reconvene in person, but we want to keep things safe and we'll make sure that it's practical for everybody. So we'll have more updates on that, but we are working on it. So make sure you follow us on social, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Make sure that you stay up to date on what's going on with us and we'll announce those things as they come together. When you do join us, please take lots of pictures. We want to thank our resident photographer, Katrina, for taking pictures every Sunday. But if you're here with us on Sunday morning, take some pictures, tag us online, share it with your friends, check in on Facebook. Let people know that you're still doing church, uh, still gathering with the body of Christ. And we just want to be out in social media, and we want to celebrate that. So if you took some pictures, I see you snapping them. Go ahead and tag Searchlight Church and let people know that we're doing that. So. Without further ado, we want to move on with our service, and we'd like to take this time to receive our tithes and offerings. And let me just say thank you so much for continually giving uh, out of what God has blessed you with, because you've been so faithful. Uh, we haven't skipped a beat through COVID. It's been months where whole organizations are figuring out how are they going to keep doing business. And you guys keep giving, and so we keep being able to bless, keep being able to meet, keep being able to create content. So thank you for honoring God with what he's blessed you with. And there's a couple ways you can do that if you'd like to participate with us. Uh, number one, you can send a check to our administrative offices, and that's Searchlight Church, 1 Main Street, Suite 203, and that's in Eatontown, 07724. So you can drop a check in the mail. You can go to our website, searchlightchurch.com, and click on the Give tab at the top right. That will drop down and it will let you give through PayPal or Tithely, and you can give right through PayPal. Or my favorite way to give is to download the Tithely app to your phone, which lets you set up recurring giving, uh, one-time gifts. It lets you give special uh, donations. But basically, you never go anywhere without your phone. You never go anywhere without the opportunity to honor God with what he's blessed you with. So go ahead and you can do that during the service. Or if you forgot from last week, you can do it anytime, anywhere. So thank you for your faithfulness. Let me pray for you before we move on with our service. God, thank you so much for your provision. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for all the things you're doing in our lives. And God, we just thank you for inviting us to be a part of what you're doing in Long Branch and Ocean and beyond, God. So thank you for using us to bring hope uh, and message of freedom and of your love to people maybe who are feeling hopeless and not loved. So use this temporary thing like money to make an eternal difference in the hearts of the people around us. And thank you, God, for the opportunity to be a part of your mission to reach and teach people to live in love like you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Now, after you've given your uh, tithes and offerings, let's go ahead and give Pastor Chris a warm welcome as he brings week two of He's Still Got the Whole World in His Hands. Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Searchlight Church Online. My name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor, and I get the privilege of sharing God's word with you guys today. And just want to say whether you're watching it live today in September or if you're watching it uh, at another time or in another place, uh, we sincerely believe that you're not here by accident. And I think that God has you here for a reason. So I hope that um, what I have to share today will speak to your heart. Today we're in week two of calling He's Still Got the Whole World in His Hand. So right now I want you to raise your hand and be honest. How many of you feel sometimes like you're not quite sure if God is still in control of everything, right? There are times in my life when I know what I believe uh, in my mind, but I just don't feel in my heart and in my emotions that God's totally in control, especially now in the uncertain times that we're living in. You know, we can start to really doubt that truth in our lives. Um, getting uh, ready to enter the eighth month 
of a global pandemic. How many of you right now would admit that you're sick and tired of wearing a mask everywhere? Our nation seems to be more divided than ever before in history. We have a major election coming up in a few months, and it seems like conflict and stress are going to be a byproduct uh, of this no matter who ends up in the White House. And that's not even mentioning all of the individual life stresses that each of us are facing in our homes and among our families and our friends. And so that's the reason that we decided to spend a few months talking about this truth that God really is still in control even when it feels completely out of control all around us. Last week we kicked off the series by asking the question, God, are you still in control? And we learned that the Bible is really a record of God's faithfulness throughout uncertain times. Now, if you watched last week online, you would have heard Pastor Tim deliver the message from his house. And if you came out to our outdoor service, you would have heard me. And the reason that Tim didn't preach outside uh, is that he and Erica were right in the middle of some very uncertain times themselves as they were awaiting the arrival of their firstborn. And Ellie was actually born last Sunday morning right before we had church outside. Um, I was forbidden to say anything, um, so I had to hold that in. But I knew she was here already when I got up to preach. And so it was uncertain. And, And the truth is, even in that uncertain time like that, God was still in control. God's in control of everything that's going on around us. And as we wrapped up the message, we asked another question. Is it possible that God is still active? and still accomplishing his purposes when there seems to be no indication of his activity. And of course, we believe that the answer is yes. God is always active, and he's always in control, even when we can't see it. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk uh, a little bit about one of the byproducts of uncertainty in our lives. And Right now, I want you to take a, a real look in the mirror at your life and answer this question for me. How many of you are feeling some level of anxiety at this point in your life? Some level of anxiety. And in case you're not sure if you have anxiety or not, let me share with you the official definition of the word anxiety. And I think you'll see that probably all of us are affected by this. Here's the definition of anxiety. A feeling of worry. How many of you right now have a feeling of worry in your life about something, a feeling of nervousness or unease, typically about an imminent event. So we have imminent events coming up that cause worry or unease or something with an uncertain outcome. That's a great definition of anxiety, a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome outcome. I don't know about you, but when I look at anxiety through that definition, I think we are all living with some level of anxiety in our lives. And sometimes it can get so bad that we can reach a place where we feel like we've had enough. Some of us sometimes become even paralyzed by our anxiety. I think people in general have been paralyzed through this pandemic. Not that we shouldn't be taking it seriously and not that it's something that we have to to really be careful with, but I believe there's been way too much hysteria. Thanks a lot to the media and social media for that. Maybe for you, it's paralyzed by anxiety over your marriage or your kids and you feel like you've just had enough. Maybe it's your job and maybe it's been uncertain in the recent past or for a long time. Listen, I could go on and on about anxiety and uncertainty. The Apostle Paul had something to say about it in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to come back and look at these verses over and over again and pull out a lot of truths that will help us in this area of anxiety. Listen to what he said. He said, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you're considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Now, the NIV says the Lord is near. We're going to come back to that towards the end of the message. He goes on to say in verse 6, don't worry about anything. Again, the NIV says don't be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he's done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds 
as you live in Christ Jesus. So today, I want to explore this concept with you, and it's actually the first fill-in on your note card. So if you downloaded the digital note card this morning and you're going to follow along, go ahead and fill this in. It's actually a question that I want to ask. How can we face our fears without forgetting our God? Now, before I go any further this morning, let's listen to what we just read and put it into practice. Let's take a moment, bow your head with me, let's close our eyes, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what your word tells us, that you are near, that you never leave us nor forsake us. And so you're near, and so we acknowledge this morning that we have anxieties, times of uncertainty, imminent things coming up in our future that make us feel uncertain. And we thank you for your faithfulness and everything you've, you've done for us in the past. And so, God, we just commit this next few moments to you, ask you to teach us from your word and help us to be more like you, we pray. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but when I read Philippians 4, sometimes I have to ask myself the question, is it even possible to be anxious about nothing? Is that even a realistic possibility? With everything going on in the world, all the issues we face as individuals and families, is this verse of the Bible even possible to live by? Well, today I want to spend our time looking at the life of a guy named Elijah. And you can find a lot of the account of his life in the Old Testament in the book of 1 Kings. Um, Elijah was one of the most famous and most powerful prophets that God had ever sent to the people of Israel. And as we look at his story, we can see some of the amazing ways that God showed up in and through Elijah's life. But Elijah also had some incredible lows where he caved into his anxiety and stress, much like we do from time to time in our life. So quickly, grab your Bibles, grab your smartphones if that's what you're using, and I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 17, and I want to point out three things that we can see from the life of Elijah that, that we need to focus on that will help us face our fears without forgetting our God. Now listen, before I go any further into this, um, let me give you some backstory. This was during the reign of a guy named King Ahab, and he is described this way in the previous chapter. It says, he did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. So he was a pretty bad guy. So Ahab's pretty horrible, and he brought idol worship to new heights among the people of Israel. He erected all kinds of gods to take the place of the God of Israel. So let's pick up and start reading in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. It says this, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain for the next few years except at my word. So Elijah's prophesying a massive drought um, that's going to come over the land because the people were disobedient and they were unfaithful to God. Verse 2 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. So guys, here's the first thing that we need to focus on that will help us to face our fears without forgetting our God. We need to focus on God's presence in our lives. That's the, your next fill-in. We need to focus on God's presence. Elijah knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that the very presence of God was with him at all times. Not only did God speak directly to Elijah, telling him what to prophesy about the drought, but then he gave him specific instructions about where to go and where to hide out. Elijah knew that the presence of God was with him, and because of that, he could face his anxieties and fears. You know, in Exodus, when Moses was about to lead the people toward the promised land, he had a conversation with God, and it's not in your notes, but it kind of went like this. As the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses. I will give you rest. Everything with you will be fine. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us? For, the, for your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the other people in the earth. You know, Jesus said, actually, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He was talking about his presence, the very presence of God. So as followers of Jesus, God's presence is a promise to us that as we follow him, um, we can rest and we don't have to give in to our, our anxiety. So second thing that we have to focus on is God's provision. And we also learn this from Elijah. Let's pick up reading in verse 4. God said this, You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. 
So he did what the Lord told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Listen, I don't know about you, but I have never had birds come and bring me anything except drop some things on my car or, you know, on my property, right? But I have seen the hand of God provide for me in my lifetime, time and time again. In fact, I could easily fill a 45-minute sermon just by asking people from our church to get up in front of this camera and share their personal stories about how God has provided for them over and over. Elijah not only focused on God's presence, but he experienced God's miraculous provision. So let me ask you, how has God provided for you in the past? I know, I know for me, I've had at least two cars given to me when I didn't have money for a car. There might even have been a third one. I try, was trying to remember way back in college if that happened, right? God has provided by people's generosity to my family. He's provided through the benevolence of family and church over the years in my life. And he has provided by unexpected job opportunities as well as things like unexpected tax returns and rebates. I, guys, in my lifetime, things have shown up where I was up against the wall and I was anxious and God Provided. When we are facing our fears, we need to focus on God's presence and his provision. And lastly, we need to focus on God's power. We don't have time to read the next few chapters um, now, so I want you to go back and read them for yourselves. Um, chapter 17, chapter 18, chapter 19. But over the next few chapters, Elijah experienced some amazing Things. You know, you can read how he stayed with a widow and her son who were just about ready to cook up their last supplies and eat their last meal before they died. And through God's power, they never ran out of food. And at one point, this widow's son died, and, and Elijah witnessed the power of God work through him as he brought that child back from the dead. Then in chapter 18, Elijah faces off against King Ahab and 450 prophets or false prophets of this false god Baal. Uh, you can read it for yourself. It's an amazing account, but I'll, I'll give you the, the real quick overview. Elijah called for a contest between the God of Israel and the false god Baal. So Elijah says, we're going we're gonna to have a showdown, and it's biblical proportions. He said, get me two bulls, and you guys take your pick. Take the best of the animals to be sacrificed. Pick the one you want, prepare an altar, and ask your God to accept the sacrifice. It says that they, they did it. They picked the one they wanted. They built their altar. They prepared it, and they did everything. They cried out for hours upon hours. They beat themselves into where they were bleeding. They did every custom that was theirs as they worshiped their false god Baal, and nothing happened. I, I even love how the Bible records that Elijah mocked them. Well, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe you need to speak a little louder. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's, you know, not paying attention right now. And when they were all done and nothing had happened, Elijah rebuilt his altar that had been destroyed. It tells us that he prepared the sacrifice, and then he took it a step further, right? He, he built the altar, put the wood, put the sacrifice, and then he soaked it with water. In fact, he did that, repeated that several other times, basically saying there is no way a human being could light this thing on fire. Then with a prayer to the God of Israel, everyone watched as God sent down fire from heaven. In fact, it records that the fire was so powerful, it consumed the sacrifice, the entire pile of wood, every stone that was part of the altar, and it even soaked up the water that was left over on the ground around the altar. As the people began to cry out, because obviously they knew who the real God was, as people began to cry out and repent, Elijah had the 450 false prophets of Baal arrested and put to death because of their idol worship. Talk about the power of God. What a powerful story. God didn't just consume the animal sacrifice, which would have been par powerful enough. He burned everything up that there was nothing left. You know what the Bible says? The same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive and active in us. Guys, the key to facing our fears without forgetting our God is to focus on God's presence, God's power, uh, God's provision, and God's power in our lives. But even with all of the incredible things that God did in and through Elijah, he still had some amazingly low times of anxiety 
in despair. In fact, all we have to do is keep reading, and we can see what happened in his life. God's word tells us that as horrible, as treacherous as King Ahab was, his wife was worse. Shout out to all the strong women out there, right? His wife was worse than him. Ahab was married to a guy, uh, to a lady named Jezebel. And it tells us that when Ahab went home and told her everything that had happened, especially how Elijah killed all of her prophets, she swore this. It says, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And this is at this the point, after everything amazing that Elijah had seen and experienced, he reached the point where he felt, I've had enough, I can't take it anymore. How many of you would be honest this morning and say you've reached that place in your life from time to time? And you, maybe you've seen God's hand move in your life time and time again. You felt his presence, you've received provision, right? And you've witnessed his power, but there's that last straw. It's just that place in your life where you feel like, God, I can't take any more. I've had enough. Well, in the next few verses, I think we can find four mistakes that we all make when we've had enough. Four mistakes. We can learn them from Elijah's life, and they're probably things that you have faced in your life from time to time. So let's pick up in chapter 19. Jezebel has just sworn Uh, that she's going to hunt down and kill Elijah for killing all of these prophets. And it tells us that Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah. That's what it says. That's kind of where we start off there in verse 3. The first mistake that we make oftentimes when we feel like we've had enough and anxiety is creeping in is that we run ourselves into the ground. Anybody been there before? We get so caught up in our anxiety and our fear that it's like we get on a hamster wheel in our lives and we just run and run and run ourselves into the ground. Have you ever noticed that about yourself? When you're fearful, your heart is racing and you're starting to well up with anxiety and even though you've seen God do all these other things in the past, you become overcome by your worries and you start scrambling to figure out a solution, some way to save yourself, some way to fix the problem and alleviate your stress. It tells us that Elijah ran to Beersheba, which is a hundred miles away from where he was. Think about the power that Elijah had witnessed, right? I mean, he just is coming off, calling down fire from heaven, consuming this soaking wet altar. He just commanded that 450 false prophets are killed. I mean, talk about a victory, wiping out everybody that represented this false god. And now, because of the threat of this woman, he's running for his life. You know, that's probably where some of us are this morning, right? Running ourselves into the ground because of fear and anxiety. Maybe you found yourself thinking things to yourself like, if I don't figure this out, who will? If I don't come up with a solution to this, if I don't work harder and try to get it all done, who's going to do it? If I don't do something to save myself and my family, who will? If I don't take a second job or a third job, even though I know it's going to kill me, even though it means I'll never see my family, even though it means I'll have to not go to church anymore because i got to work that third job, I have to do this or I'll never make it. The first thing we tend to do, guys, when we get overwhelmed, when we feel like we've had enough, is we start to run ourselves into the ground instead of stopping and asking God to show us the way. Second mistake we tend to make when we feel like um, we've had enough is that we start to shut people out of our lives. Let's go back to Elijah's story for a moment. Pick it up in verse 3. It says, Elijah was afraid. He fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. And then he went alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. After running and running at a pace that was making it worse, Elijah left his trusted servant and friend and ran a full day longer into the wilderness. Guys, I don't know about you. Have you ever noticed that happening in your life when you hit the end of your rope, when you feel like you're overwhelmed by anxiety, when you feel like you just can't take it anymore? Rather than getting closer to people, you start pushing people away in your lives and going out all by yourself. 
Listen, we firmly believe here at Searchlight that you can't do life alone. That's why we believe life groups are so important in our lives. And when you're feeling pressed by anxiety, the last thing you need to do is be off all by your own. We need each other. And so mistake number two is that he shut the people out in his life that he had around him to help him. Here's the third mistake that we often make when we hit a place in anxiety where enough is enough and we can't go any further. We focus on the negative in our lives. Let's pick back up again in this verse. It says, Then he went out on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Notice Elijah isn't thanking God for the bread and the meat that the ravens had delivered right to him. He's not thanking God for miraculously replenishing the the widow's food supply so that they didn't starve, or the power to raise her son from the dead. He's not thanking God for showing up with fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice or the power to kill all 450 prophets of Baal. All he's focused on is that he's tired, he's anxious, and he's had enough. And, And guys, if we're all honest, the same happens many times for us. When we reach the end of our rope, we focus on the negative things, the thing that's right in front of us that we feel like we can't get over, forgetting everything that God has done in our past. The Bible says that we will overcome, you can read this in in, uh, the New Testament, that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That means that we need the power of God, but we also need reflection and memory of the ways that God has come through in the past. That's what your testimony is. All the ways that God has shown himself faithful, that is the way that we overcome. Here's a fourth mistake that we often make when we feel like we've had enough and we're consumed with anxiety. We totally forget our God. We totally forget the God that we're serving. Elijah had run a hundred miles fleeing for his life. He left his servant behind and ran for another full day into the wilderness. He collapsed under a tree. He gave in to a negative situation that he was in. And as he forgot all about what God had already done, it tells us that he fell asleep in complete exhaustion. Now listen, it's easy for us to read this story right now and judge Elijah as we're reading it. But if we're honest, guys, all of us have probably been there at one time or another in our lives. Anxious, terrified, Consumed by negativity and exhausted, we forget our God and how faithful and how powerful he really is. And we just want it to be over. Have you ever thought to yourself, just kill me now, God? (laughs) Right? Like, I just, it can be over, game over. And if you continue reading, you'll see that as Elijah slept, an angel woke him up and told him to get up and eat. Says that God prepared fresh bread on hot rocks, and a jar of water for him. I mean, just another amazing provision. And he ate, he drank, and he went back to sleep. This happened another time. And then Elijah traveled 40 days to Mount Sinai, and he spent the night in a cave. Let's pick up in verse 9 as we read together. I want you to read what actually happened here. It says, Then he came to the cave where he spent the night, but the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, And he's, so all these days later, and he's still feeling this way, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they they are trying to kill me too. What we're about to see in this next portion of Scripture, I think, is amazing. You know, the truth is, God didn't respond to Elijah by rebuking him. You know, God doesn't say, knock it off, loser. God doesn't say, like, suck it up, man. I mean, look at all the things I have done for you, Elijah. God doesn't say that he's angry with him for forgetting. He, he, he doesn't express that he's displeased or that he's disappointed in the way he's behaving. He's, he's not frustrated with Elijah for forgetting God's presence and his provision and his power. That It says this, This is what God says in verse 11. It says, Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. 
After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Truth is, God didn't judge Elijah. Instead, he met him in the middle of his deepest need. That's your last major fill-in this morning, if you're still taking notes. God will always meet you in the middle of your need. Truth is, at every point of Elijah's need, God was there to meet him. Think about it. When he needed a place to hide and eat, God met him by the Jordan River and fed him with meat and bread from ravens. When he needed food and shelter, God sent him to the widow's home and provided supplies. When he, he needed a miracle to save her son, God met him with the power to raise that boy from the dead. When he needed a huge public display of power, God met him at the altar that he built to defeat Baal. And when he was desperate, when he was wanting to die because he couldn't get, go a day further, God met him under a broom tree and in a cave in the wilderness. I find it interesting that, that God showed off his power and might to Elijah by sending wind, by sending an earthquake, and by sending fire. And yet he was not in any of those things trying to talk to Elijah. It was only in the gentle whisper of God that Elijah found the presence of God. Sometimes I think we don't hear the voice of God because we're busy looking for him to show up in huge, miraculous signs. Sometimes we see what looks like God showing up in other people's lives in big ways, and we want him to speak to us the same way it looks like he's speaking to others. I can remember being in Bible college it was a lot of years ago, right? I can remember being broke, working several jobs, and having a tuition bill that was piling up. I can remember different times thinking I was going to have to go home and take a semester off because I was out of money, and I had to go home and save up so that I could come back, wondering how the tuition was going to be paid. And I would hear stories from some of my classmates, how they went to their mailbox and miraculously there was a check there to pay their tuition. Or how some anonymous donor paid their tuition bill so they could stay. And I remember checking my mailbox and thinking, there's no check and there's no anonymous donor for me. But you know, God chose to provide for me in different ways. More ordinary ways, like maybe some overtime at work or an extra shift or an opportunity to make a little extra money somewhere else. So listen, when you're in need of God to meet you right in the middle of your anxiety and your fear, let me challenge you a couple ways. Number one, to look for God. To look for God, right? Challenge you to look for him and, and maybe different than you've looked in the past. Maybe not look for him in the big stuff, in the loud stuff, in the giant miraculous things that you're hoping that are like worthy of posting on Instagram or Facebook, hey, God showed up and dropped this miraculous thing. But let me ask you to first look for God in the quiet, not the loud. God spoke to Elijah after all of the running and complaining and worrying through a quiet whisper, not a loud boom. All too often, we can't sense God's voice and his peace because we won't shut up long enough to hear him whisper to us. Is there a chance that God is allowing you right now to go through what you're facing so that he can get you to the point where all you can do is lay there quiet, hoping that he just, just kill me now so he can whisper in a still small voice to you? We also need to look for God up close and not from a distance. Why did God speak to Elijah in a whisper? Because he was close to him. You know, in my life, the most tender things that I've said to those I love tend to be in a whisper. Like, good night and I love you in a whisper to the kids before they go to sleep. Maybe words of love or affirmation that I would whisper to Cheryl that are not meant to be heard by everybody else. They're only something that I would whisper to her quietly because I'm close to her and I know exactly what she's going through. I, I've heard this said before, that the devil often shouts his accusations from a distance. You're a failure. You'll never make it. You'll never be any different. You can't fool everyone for long. God hasn't saved you. This whole thing is a hoax. The devil shouts those things from a distance, but God comes in a gentle whisper. Why? Because he's right next to you. He whispers in your ears. I'm right here with you. 
I've never left your side. I'll carry you when you can't go any further. And I've gone ahead of you, and I know what you're going to need down the road, and I've already prepared it. Remember what Paul said in Philippians about not being anxious for anything? He said, always be full of joy. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you're considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. And the NIV says, the Lord is near. So don't worry. The Lord is near, so don't worry. Is it possible that the key to not worrying, to not giving in to anxiety, is it possible that the key to understanding that his peace comes into our lives, it passes all understanding, is it possible that it starts with remembering that God is near you, where he can just whisper into your ear? It's like when I was a kid and I was afraid of the dark, I could fall asleep as long as the hall light was on and I could hear that my mom and dad were talking in the house. It's like being in school and having an older sibling or cousin ahead of you. You knew that if you got bullied, there was someone there that was near that could come and balance the scales for you. So as I wrap it up, when you're feeling consumed with anxiety, wondering if God is still here, if he still has the whole world in his hands, we need to look for God But even more importantly, we need to turn around. That's your last little fill-in on your card. We need to turn around. You know, after Elijah tells God one more time all of the terrible things and all of the circumstance, and God comes to him again and he says, why are you here? He speaks to him in a whisper, says this, Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And then it goes on as God gives Elijah his marching orders. You know, he tells him, you're going to anoint these new kings and you're going to appoint a new prophet. Basically, he's saying, I know you're tired. I know you're worried. I know you're consumed with anxiety, but I have it all under control. I still have the whole world in my hands. And so God says several things to him. He says, turn around and stop running. Turn around and stop running. No more running in the wrong direction, Elijah. Away from your problems. We're going to face this thing together. And I have a plan. I still have it all in my hands. For some of us today, that's part of what we need to do. Stop running. Stop running 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction, burning yourself out because of anxiety. Instead, turn around and start walking back with God towards the things you have to face. Then God said, turn around and let people in. That's what God said to him. God says, I'm going to give you new kings, new prophets. Basically, you're not going to do this alone. You need to let people into your life again. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you've been running 100 miles an hour and you're pushing people out of your lives. And God says, hey, I want you to turn around. I want you to stop running. And I want you to start letting people back into your life so that we can deal with this. Third, God said, turn around and focus on the positive. This is what he was saying to Elijah. No more negative, Elijah. It's a new season and a new direction. I've heard all the negative. I've seen all of it, and I know it's been hard, but there's hope and a future for you and for my people, and it's time to focus on that. Some of you need to hear that today. Some of us in the midst of months of this pandemic and all kinds of craziness, we are so focused on the negative, we can't even possibly see where God's faithful and his provision is there for our lives. And we need to stop focusing on the negative and hear what God says today and focus on the positive. And lastly, it's time to turn around and remember what God has done. I wonder if with every step that Elijah had to take as he returned out of the wilderness, he began to remember all of the amazing things that God had done. I mean, every step that he took to get back to Damascus, to get back to where he needed to be, to get back on track to doing the things that God called him to do. I wonder if with every step, God just began to remind him, hey, remember when you were fed by ravens? (laughs) Remember that day when I came down there and smoked that altar and took care of all those false prophets? You need to remember that and stay positive. Right now where you're at this morning, in your home, wherever you're watching this, would you just bow your head, close your eyes with me as I wrap this up this morning? I wonder if you're here today within the sound of my voice and you're worried, does God really have the whole world in his hands still? Maybe you're running yourself into the ground. You're you're like Elijah and you're just, you feel like you've had enough and you can't take one more day and you're running and running trying to save yourself. Maybe you're all alone because systematically you have shut people out of your lives. 
life. You're, maybe you stopped tuning into the broadcast. Maybe today's the first day you got back and watched church in a while. Maybe you're avoiding coming out to our Sunday mornings outside at 1030 because you're just shutting people out and you're overwhelmed with this and you, you're, you're all wrapped up with anxiety and fear and so you're pushing people out. Maybe you're consumed with focusing on the negative about your situation. You're all wrapped up in the news and social media and everything that seems just to be negative around us and you just can't get out of it. Maybe you have actually totally forgotten what God has done in your life. You know, I know that's possible. It's happened in my life. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying sometimes we forget all of the things that God has done, all of the ways that he's shown up and been faithful in our lives. We forget it. Whatever the case, know this, that God is ready and willing to meet you right in the middle of where you are today. Guys, he's not angry with you for a lack of faith or having anxiety. He's not disappointed in you if you've pushed people out of your life and you're alone. He's not shouting at you like wind and earthquake and fire. In fact, it's the exact opposite. He's super close to you. In fact, we like to put it this way. No matter how far you've walked from God, all you have to do is turn around. He's right there behind you. He's right there waiting for you to turn back to him. He's close. He's whispering to you to get up, turn around, and let me take care of you. Truth is, guys, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's why God didn't expect us to reach up to him for salvation. Instead, he sent his son Jesus down to us to meet us right in the middle of our need for salvation. And so with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning, I want to pray a couple simple prayers. Number one, if you're watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. It's as simple as praying a prayer, believing in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God and that he gave his life for us and that by accepting his sacrifice on the cross, we can become new, we can become born again. And so if that's you and you're watching this video and you say, you know, I know that I'm separate from God, I'm not talking about religion, I'm not even talking about going to church and trying to be a good person, I'm talking about the fact that Every single one of us is born with a sinful nature. We have a sin problem. The only way to fix that is for somebody to pay the penalty of sin. And Jesus did that for us already. We just have to receive it. So I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. If that's you, would you just repeat this prayer after me? I'm gonna believe together with you that when you pray this prayer, you're gonna become a new creation, as the Bible says. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. And I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Right now, I invite you to come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and I ask you to make me a new person. I ask you to help me to live for you the rest of the days of my life. And thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, for dying for me and, and saving me from my sins. I pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you do me a favor? Write it in the comments. Send us a private message. Email us at hello at searchlightchurch.com. Let us know that you prayed that prayer. We would love to reach out to you and make sure that you get all the encouragement you need on your new spiritual journey that you just started today. For the rest of us that are maybe dealing with anxiety, we're frustrated, we're not even sure if he's still got the whole world in his hands, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that you'll see yourself in the life of Elijah, that God has been present in your life. He's shown off his power and his provision, but you're just kind of struggling, feeling like you've had enough. And I want to pray for you and challenge you to remember today that he's still got the whole world in his hands. Just bow your heads with me and close your eyes. I want to pray for you. Lord, I pray for everybody that's watching, that's, that's struggling. Uh, that we're not alone. All of us get there sometimes. I pray for your power and your might and your presence just to swell in, God, that you come in a tiny whisper into our hearts that you're still here, you still got it under control, will we just turn around and relinquish these things back to you and trust you? Lord, we remember today that, God, you are near, and so we don't want to be anxious for everything, but we trust you, and we bring it to your attention, God, and we thank you for everything you've done for us already in our lives. We put our hope and our trust in you. Help us to have your peace in these times of anxiety and stress, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God, thank you that you have the whole world in your hands. Guys, I hope that that message spoke to you this morning. 
God does still have the whole world in his hands, and so we're excited to uh, walk it out together. I want to challenge you to be back next week as we jump into the third week. Like, comment, and share this video, and we'll see you next week for part three of He Still Got the Whole World in His Hands. Have a great week, guys. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for Church Online today. So glad I got to join with you at least digitally. And if you like this message, go ahead and make sure that you like, share, and comment so this gets in front of other people. It'll be a great way for everybody to see what's going on in your life and the lives of people at Searchlight. I just want to take a second to say thank you guys for all you've done for my family, the gifts, the food, uh, all the prayers you guys have been reaching out. Thank you so much. It's just a great way God's been providing for our family. And in fact, talking about from this sermon series, the things we need to focus on God's presence and provision and power. If you have a testimony, I want to encourage you to go ahead and put that on your Facebook page. So write out your testimony of God's power or provision or his presence and go ahead and tag Searchlight Church in that on Facebook or uh, Twitter or on Instagram, wherever you are, so that people can see your testimony and we can be reminded that God is with us. He meets us in the middle of our mess and that he's still got the whole world in his hands. So make sure you do that this week and uh, no devotional this week, but we'll be back next week with something new and exciting for you. Make sure you share this video. Thanks for hanging out with us this Sunday morning. I hope you have an amazing week. Talk to you soon.